Hi guys, I'm Courtney. And I'm Lisa. And welcome to the next chapter in the Book of the Dead, brought to you by Dark Cast Network, Indie Podcasts with a Twist. Is this thing on? Okay, good. I am sorry to interrupt your listening pleasure, but my name is Tiffany and I'm here to tell you about my podcast, True Crime Connections. It's an advocacy podcast that talks with real survivors about real shit. This is the place you want to be if you've been in a toxic relationship or anything tragic has happened to you and you're looking to find your strength and healing. No two episodes are alike, but they all give you useful tools that you can take with you. So make sure to find me on your favorite podcast platform, or you can go to truecrimeconnections.com and come join the Hope Building community. See you there. Hello, hello. Welcome to the next chapter in the Book of the Dead. With me today, I have an absolute powerhouse in the true crime community. She knows the true crime world firsthand and has wrote numerous books on different true crime subjects. So today with me, I have Aphrodite Jones to talk about her book, The Embrace, a true vampire story. And this is a case that you guys might be familiar with, might not be familiar with. I have covered it, but it is the Rod Farrell case. And Aphrodite is going to take us through this story in the way that only she can do. So Aphrodite, thank you for joining me today. Thank you for having me. It's an honor. I appreciate it very much. So let's get into it. Let's jump right in. What is it about this case that drew you in? You know, why did you decide to write about it? You know, take me through everything. Sure. So back in time when I wrote this story in in the mid-90s, there really wasn't the kind of crime that we see teens committing today. In fact, it was an anomaly back then. We didn't really see so much of teens killing adults or each other. Um, it, it, It was, to me, a signal to the world that we really need to watch over our teenagers and pay attention to what they're doing in their back rooms because in this case, Heather Wendorf was, and the the main character in the book, was talking with uh, Rod Farrell, who at that time was lived in Kentucky, but he also spent part time with his father in Florida where Heather lived. And so the two of them got together, but for the most part, they were talking on the phone. And they would talk throughout the night and day and night whenever she had the opportunity. And in essence, Rod Farrell convinced her that he was a vampire and he could time travel and he could make people immortal. He could embrace them, give the embrace to turn them into his minions, which of course is crazy. But again, This is a a separate story of teens mixing reality with fantasy. And again, we we are only seeing a lot of that now. We did not see that in the past. The most important thing that I want to talk about is why the teenagers today, why is there so much violence? I mean, back in time, the Columbine shooting had not yet happened. And we start to see, you know, school shootings and teenagers killing each other more and more. It's almost become passe. It's hard for me to believe that. What do you think? It's definitely true. And that's something that I remember talking about when I originally was going through this case was that. Back in even, you know, the 90s when this happened, you didn't read so much about kids killing kids or kids killing adults. It wasn't really a thing until, you know, obviously this is the most publicized 
case or one of the most publicized case of kids killing or teenagers killing. And then now, I mean, you can rarely go a week without hearing about a teenager that has committed some horrific crime. And there is something to be said about like, what is influencing them? You know, you have the nature versus nurture, but you know, people want to, there've been that, you know, it's the age old argument of video games cause violence and, and things like that. But it's, it's interesting that there are these kids out there that are truly rotten to the core and rod was a perfect example of that it was just there's something to be said within him that was evil and some of these kids now are just as bad and it's like i i can't wrap my head around it oh and you know here's the thing it's not just that they're evil because you know we see that in a lot of these schoolhouse shootings sort of a mental problem, but also there has been, since this crime, this early crime of teen violence, there have have been many people who have gone into schools and shot their former classmates or their classmates in a copycat kind of way to what happened in Columbine. And, you know, that's what's so disturbing here, Courtney, is why, and, and I'm asking the question, trying to answer the question as to why these young kids are so much led astray from reality that they would go ahead and murder people and more than one person. And in the case of the embrace, Heather Wendorf's parents were murdered. How did she go along with this? What is it about peer pressure or Perhaps not even peer pressure. Perhaps it's it's bullying, or it's incumbent upon the team to to feel like they need to copy someone or show how great they are and get media attention. I mean, it's just really sad that people can't send their kids to school and not have to worry about it. They Absolutely. do have to worry about it. They do have to give that second thought to what is going to happen in my school today you know is it is my child going to be okay is my teenager going to be okay and on the flip side of this how is it that the parents don't know that they have a psychologically damaged child that is my question to you and that's i think that's something that everyone asks themselves when they hear about these horrific crimes it's how did the parents not know and it's it's true i've I've said it myself how do you how do you not know is it that you are in so much denial that something is wrong with your child that they could potentially have the propensity to do something so violent it it a part of me is it is it you know like i understand you know a parent loves their child no matter what but there there has to be a line drawn, you know, you love your child, but you have to acknowledge if there is violence within them. And and the thing is, if you notice, most recently, two parents were actually convicted of criminal acts and are being sent to prison for the acts of their child. And that is the first. That sets the precedent. But in that case, you have the mom not only give her son a gun, but also Bringing him to school, allowing him to be in school, going to the school, knowing that he's drawing pictures of guns, pictures that are warped. And she, the mother was told by the school, you need to come get your son. He's acting very strangely. He's a problem. And you can't leave him in school right now. We don't know what's happening. He's, he's you know, having trouble psychologically. And it's been noticed by teachers and students. And that mother refused to take him home that day. She left him in school that day. Now, did she know her son was going to pull a gun? No. But did she, was she responsible for giving him the gun, for allowing him to stay in school when she was warned that very same day that this is a problem? So it makes sense that she and her husband were convicted criminally. I wonder if other parents will be convicted since that precedent has been set because 
it just seems like some of them know that their kid is into guns, know that their kid has psychological problems. It's been reported before. We've heard that so many times. Why don't parents try to get their kids some help? For me, I think it's it's a lot of, you know, they don't they don't want to acknowledge there's a problem. I don't know if it's they don't want it to reflect negatively on themselves. But you're absolutely right that, you know, she in in that case, she essentially enables the incident to happen. She literally put the gun in her child's hands. She ignored the warning signs. And for what? For someone to get hurt. And she rightfully so was convicted of criminal charges in relation to that. So is her husband. And there are absolutely parents out there that have ignored the warning signs or dismissed the warning signs and allowed things to happen. And they should have been held just as accountable as their children. Yes. So the flip side of this is that in this story, the embrace, it wasn't other teens that got killed, but it was one guy, Rod Farrell, who had convinced his minions, his followers, if you will, to do bloodletting, to do the embrace, to become a half-winged person, and eventually a, a vampire with an immortal life. And the result of this was that Heather Wendorf allowed Rod Farrell to come and get her, said that she would like her parents dead, which many teenagers do and don't mean it. And the day she was, quote, embraced by Rod Farrell, she went off with him and the group of teenagers he brought with him, who also wanted to become vampires, and they headed to New Orleans where, you know, Vampire Central with Anne Rice writing these books. Her parents did not know that Heather was in contact with this psychotic person, that Heather's friend had given this person a map of how to get to the Wendorf house and where the parents would be. Now, that is something so premeditated and so bizarre what what is it in her parents that didn't notice any change in Heather? Heather had gone from being, you know, a good student to suddenly she's dyeing her hair, she's, you know, acting weird, she's not the same kid she was. She's almost a goth. And you know, I, I get it that teenagers want to forge their own way and come up with new plans, but in this case, she literally believed that Rod Farrell could be, help her become immortal. One part of her believed it. The other side of her was curious and wanting to experience whatever it was that he could offer in terms of immortality. And how weird is it that she would think this? Like, what planet are these kids on? That was what was always interesting to me about that case, especially because Heather, just based on, you know, all the research I did, was by all accounts like a good girl. She was a good student. You know, her sister was a cheerleader. It was a great family. They went on all these trips together. And then you have this guy, you have Rod come in and flip everything on its head and her whole personality changes. She's so enamored by him. And I couldn't understand that a girl as, you know, intelligent as she was, and I mean, like, just she was book smart. There had to have been a part of her the whole time that when I know you're you're full of it, there's nothing that you're saying that is rooted in reality. And she went along with it anyway. Like, was it just the allure of what he was telling her, this fantasy world that he created that had such this this strong hold on her? I think that's part of it, Courtney. I think it, there's also a part of teenagers who want to believe that they can be immortal. You know, of course, when you're a teenager, you, the world is yours. But on top of it, to think that, gee, immortality can be offered to me. Or in essence, I can run off with these people and have a different life. I can get away from my parents who are, you know, 
somewhat strict, influencing or trying to interfere with what it is she wanted to become. So they did, in this case, pay some attention to the change in her, but not enough to really, I don't know that they could have known that Heather was dealing with a psychotic person, especially since it was on the phone. I don't know if they could have known this. They, they would know their daughter was changing. But in this story, Heather didn't become a total goth. Heather was dealing with someone that lived out of state. They couldn't know that. And ultimately what happened is Rod Farrell and his buddy went into her house. His other friends lured Heather out of the house first. They cut the phone lines. This was back before there were cell phones. They went into the house, and on the way in, Rod picked up a tire iron in the garage and first beat to death Heather's father, who was laying on the couch watching TV, minding his own business, and then they went for the mother. Rod Farrell caught the mother as she was coming out of the shower and it just so happened that she, he, he got her in the kitchen. It was at a ranch house. And she threw a, a, a cup of hot coffee at him. That was the only defense she could make. And he killed her, bludgeoned her. The weird part about this story, the weirdest part, and, and he, by the way, carved a V into her father, bizarre, into his chest. Heather Wendorf went off with Rod Farrell and this group of other teens headed to New Orleans for this, quote, new life, different life. She allowed the bloodletting to occur. And while she was in the car escaping from her house, it was the fact that Rod Farrell was driving her parents' SUV that she was like, what is happening? How do you have my parents' car? Why, why is this? And Rod told her. I killed your parents. You wanted them dead, and I killed your parents. Now he has them in the back seat of the car. He, and he picks up a strand of pearls that belonged to her mother to prove to her as he's holding them up. He's in the front seat, she's in the back. In the rear view mirror, she can see these are my mom's pearls. And now she knows that Rod is a murderer. She sees that there's blood on him. She, she's aware completely that this actually happened, and yet in her fantasy world, she wants to believe it didn't happen. She wants to believe, no, this was just him talking. He stole my parents' car. Um, he stole jewelry. This couldn't have happened. So it's not as though she really wanted her parents dead, nor did she believe that Rod was a psychopath. Yet, how could she not believe that when he's convincing her, trying and has convinced others that he could actually project himself, that he could go back in time and be somebody who's from a thousand years ago. Or, it, it, you know, what is it in her that not only uh, entertained this, but actually uh, lured him to where she lived and was happy to have him come there to this, bring her to a cemetery where he did this embrace. But what, what in her changed? And, and the answer I have to this is, like you say, she was going on a wrong path. Her parents didn't realize that. They looked at it as, oh, this is teen acting up. She wants to spread her wings. This is just teenage rebellion. This is what teens do. And they both wind up bludgeoned to death. Now, Heather goes into the car, is already in the car, and, she, and they're headed to New Orleans. But they make a number of stops along the way. Why doesn't she find a way to call somebody? Why doesn't she find a way to report this? And that's a big question in this story, because as it turns out, when they were stopped, and it was in Baton Rouge, one of the teens had called the mother and was scared. Now, why didn't Heather call? Well, Heather didn't call anyone, and that led police to believe that she was involved in this murder, that she really did want her parents dead, that it was her fault. And 
the weird part was when they were brought into the police station and were questioned, Heather Wendorf acted nonchalantly. She was blasé about the whole affair, which made law enforcement think all the more she was part of it, that she was a part of this group of teens who, in particular with Rod Farrell, actually killed her parents. Later, when she was questioned by a grand jury, it wasn't until then when the grand jury um, asked her questions back and forth, the DA was listening, you know, questioning her in every possible way, that the grand jury said, you know what, she's innocent. She didn't know this was going to happen. She didn't know that her parents would actually be killed. And again, this is where the cross between reality and fantasy comes to roost. And I wonder how many other teens that are out there who, as you say, video games and the fantasy of that, utilize that for committing violent acts, murder, because they're somehow caught up in a fantasy world. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I think I I, I think that's that is what what happened with Heather is that she was so caught up in this fantasy world, you know, kind of, I guess, maybe questioning, like, how far could this idea go, this, you know, idea of running away, this idea of vampires, all that, how could, how far could it go? And her, her parents ended up being a casualty of this idea. And I, I wonder if she kind of convinced herself that, you know, her parents were fine and this this fantasy world was outside of that, of outside of what had happened to her parents, um, kind of living in another world in her mind while this is happening. And with, you know, kids today, I think that for some of them, that is something that probably happens. They get so caught up in this idea of being greater than what they are and being on this different level than you know quote unquote regular people i there there was a case in russia of two teenagers that went on a rampage because they believed that they were higher beings and they killed they killed i think 12 people and it was be all because of this idea that was in their brains that they were better than, that they were higher beings, that they were the equivalent to gods. And I think that it it was another case where fantasy and reality, that line was completely blurred. Another issue that I want to talk about with, with teens who go astray and become violent is what's happening right now on the college campuses throughout the country. This idea that Supporting what's going and what went on with a terrorist organization, cutting off people's heads, babies' heads, showing it on video like for all the world to see on the internet, being proud of killing 3,000 people, 3,000 Israelites, and how it is that currently so many students have ignored the fact that the terrorism came from, a ter- you know, the murders came from a terrorist organization. And how can it be that many of these students say, I am Hamas. Uh, I, I sympathize with Hamas. Hamas is not a terrorist organization. Uh, and go after the Israelites, go after Jewish students um, violently all throughout the country. I feel that this is another um sense of a fantasy and a mix up between reality when a country has been invaded, has been terrorized like we were in 9-11 when thousands of people were killed because of it. How is it that the people who are in colleges don't see it? Why is it that there's this strange element of, you know, some students raised the flag of another country and took down the American flag, burned American flags, 
is, you know, feel that America is responsible for this. We have nothing to do with the war there between Israel and Gaza. We aren't doing that. We're not killing anyone. What is happening with these students? How do they think that they're actually going to influence what Netanyahu does, what Israel is doing to fight back? Of course, there are innocent people who are casualties. Of course, there are horrors in Gaza. You know, it amazes me that these many young people want to be in denial, want to be in denial of 9-11, some of them, want to be in denial about what America has to do with these murders. And again, I think it is a convergence of reality and fantasy. I do think that Many of them don't even understand or know whether or not the original attack was real. Some of them deny it. How does this happen in our country? How have we gotten to this point from, you know, almost 30 years ago where, where teen violence, violence on campuses, violence in high schools was unheard of? I mean, how far does this go when we look at what's going on today? Absolutely. And I think with the the age of the internet and the age of technology, it's it's gotten worse and it has. It's it's created a lot of problems. It's not to say we should all go back to the Stone Ages, but I think that there is there is misinformation and there's a lack of education around teaching our children's our children how to be safe and to recognize that there is false information and there is information that could be very alluring and very captivating. And it may not be the right kind of information. It may not be totally true. It may be a warped truth. And I think there are a lot of kids that are ignorant to that and they are taking what they're reading online and what they're seeing online and what they're consuming in the media and it's being warped as it's being fed to them. And that is, I I fully believe, is contributing to some of the violence. Because these kids, you know, being impressionable, are hearing these things. And they're agreeing with it because they have a lack of understanding. And they're taking that idea and they're allowing it to kind of mold them and their personalities. And And here you have the situation where... Not only are they protesting, but they're literally uh, going after Jewish students, harming Jewish students, you know, scaring Jewish students who now are afraid to go to their campuses and finish out their college education. Graduations are being canceled, as you may know. And, you know, there have been, there's recently in Columbia University, these students who have literally broken into one of the buildings, a historical landmark that they're, they just are destroying. It's gone beyond just violence. It's how does this, this is where coming back to the embrace and what Heather Wendorf was involved with, perhaps with misinformation or you know, wanting to join a crowd, you wonder of peers, how many of these students who are, or people who are protesting on all these college campuses and start creating violence, how many of them are going along with something as Heather Wendorf did, not even knowing what the facts are? Not, not bothering, you know, being pamphlet missionary who, again, would rather see Israelites killed, would rather see Israelites be the ones who they look at as the enemy, they look at as a a country that should not be retaliating against this act of terror. It's just so wild that we have gone from no real teen violence 30 years ago to Columbine to, you know, Virginia Tech to you know, the mass shooting in a movie theater to, you know, then now, as you say, another shooting on campus or even schools, um, high schools, elementary schools, that the parents aren't aware of, that they just allow or that somehow or another, they don't check on their kids. They don't know what's going on in their, in their world. And I think it's because, as you say, it's now the internet. It's easy for them to find 
people who agree with them. And group formations are now founded by people who are of the same mindset on the Internet. It's a real problem. It's a real problem. It goes beyond just one story or numerous stories that continue to evolve with copycat teenagers. We now have, I want to say, a twisted world. And it has to do with young people who, again, are collapsing reality with some kind of, I don't know, sense of being warriors, which is a fantasy. They are not warriors. You know what I'm saying? No, ab- absolutely, I do. And I think I think part of it is that, you know, they do. They think they're warriors. They think they're above everyone else. And a lot of them do not fear authority in any way at all. I worked in a store for a while and I saw countless teenagers, you know, anywhere from 13 to 16, absolutely run rampant and be like violent. I I will never forget a bunch of kids were fooling around. They broke a woman's foot because they got so crazy and the police were called and they're talking back to the police and they're talking back to security and they're talking, they, they have zero fear of authority. And even when I was younger, that wasn't a thing. You know, you respected authority, you feared authority. You know, if, if I was doing something wrong, you know, I never in my life had been in trouble with the police, but if I thought I was doing something wrong, you know, I stopped, you know, these kids don't, they don't fear authority. They have this superiority complex. And that's what's getting a lot of these kids into the trouble that they're getting in because there's no limit to what they think they can do. And they push those boundaries constantly to the point where people do get hurt and people lose their lives. Is it every kid that is a, you know, a a little annoying or a little aggressive or wants to cause cr- trouble in public? No, but there are those that are like that. And, you know, how many kids are going to grow up to be killers because they don't have that respect for authority, respect for another human's life because they think they're better than everyone else? So they've lost their moral compass. And this is, a, this is, you know, exactly the story that I wrote about in The Embrace. Heather lost her moral, com, uh, you know, compass. She ignored whatever warning signs there were about Rod wanting to come to her house and acting out what was a teenage wish that, oh, I wish my parents were dead. I don't know how many teenagers have thought this. I think at some point kids think this. But she verbalized it. and. Rod Carroll acted on it. And then after it happened, she didn't want to believe it. So she's, again, in a fantasy world. When she finds out that she is going to be possibly held responsible for this, she knows she can walk her way out of it. And she did. However, at that time, she was basically run out of town on a rail. Nobody in her family, in the Wendorf family, felt that she wasn't responsible. People in the town of Eustis, where she was from, didn't didn't believe her, felt that she was responsible. She did not do any media interviews. She was hiding. And, you know, when people started seeing the footage of her after the arrest, acting cavalier, you got to wonder, since she was aware now that her parents were actually dead, what what goes through her mind and why is it that back in time this happened and again now we have many more students teenagers who have absolutely no no problem with being violent with crashing windows with stealing with you know harming police as you say the authority that we had back in time that we feared and needed You need authority. You need police because they can save you from a dangerous situation, whether it's domestic violence, whether it's street violence. And yet now police are being shot. Police are being banged over the head. You know, they're being, uh, whatever, bricks are thrown at them. 
where do we go from here? How do we land in this absolute chaos? It's it's mind boggling to me because it it really it, that's it's true. It's where where can we go from here? What is the solution to rectify what has been done? And I think part of it is that many of these students are under a spell that they really have been turned around, going in the wrong direction, like Heather Wendorf did, and now it's so prevalent and they feel there's no consequences because in essence there have not been consequences in fact some of them brag what do we what will happen if you get arrested in new york in any event at nyu one of my alma maters at columbia if somebody was asked one of these uh, you know protesters was asked well what happens if you're arrested and the protesters answer was i'll go to jail for overnight and then let me out and that is happening so there, there are no consequences today. I mean, Heather Wendorf experienced consequences. Her parents were killed. She was run out of town. She could not have the life she had had anymore. But people today, young people who are, are, are rebelling and, and creating these acts of violence, there isn't the kind of consequence that we saw even 15 years ago with Columbine, even or 25 years ago that was, or in, in many of these other cases, the consequences today don't match the crime. Absolutely not. They not even close. And that's something that's always driven me crazy is you, you look at people that have been convicted of horrific crimes and, you know, some of them get, some of them get life maybe. And then others you have, they got a couple of years or there was there was someone who who murdered two teenagers, the, one, the mother of one of the teenagers and mutilated the other mother. She survived and he got 10 years. So, yeah, I mean, what kind of sentence is that? And with good time, they only have to serve half the time. I, 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 we're at a point of anarchy. And the anarchy comes from these young people. We don't see 30-year-olds, 40-year-olds doing these things. We see people of the newer, older generations saying, we need the police. We can't, you know, function as a society without the police. And yet police are regarded by the young people as enemies. It's just snowballed, Courtney. It has snowballed to a place where I don't know that we can control this anymore. How do we turn it around? Honestly, that it it it's a question that I I genuinely could not tell you the answer because it's it it, it is out of control. It is. It's out of control. You're right. It's absolute anarchy. And in in the case of you know, Rod Farrell, you know, he got the consequences that matched the crime. You know, there was a fear of police, there was a feel of fear of authority. And nowadays, there isn't that it doesn't exist. And you know, you, you know, any kid or teenager can look up a crime online and see that this person only got 10 years, or this person only got five years, or they got they they got pleaded down to lesser charges. And so it, it makes it seem as if horrific crimes are, quote unquote, not a big deal. Yes. So in the case of Rod Farrell, he was after a trial, he was sentenced by a jury to death. And later, that was commuted by the governor of Florida to life without parole. And now we're in a place where Rod Farrell is actually filing appeals to get out. So even though he murdered Heather's parents in the most violent way, he thinks it's okay now. I mean, with all that's going on in the world, maybe he'll get an appeal. Maybe he'll get out. And again, I, I just, I can't imagine that somebody would go in a house, premeditate this, and wind up murdering, slaughtering Heather's parents and think that it's all okay now. I'm, I could get out. 
at the same time, I interviewed Rod while he was in jail in a holding cell during the time of his trial. And Rod told me that he was not only immortal, but he identified with Isis and other gods and figures from mythology and was talking to me about this as if it was real. Like, he's sitting behind bars. He's being tried, and the death penalty is on the table, and he's still in this fantasy world. It was absolutely bizarre at that time. Now, we see this on a regular basis, and these young people feel there are no consequences. They can get away with whatever they want to get away with. They can smash and grab. They can steal without being uh, punished. If they steal under $10,000 worth of goods, I don't know. I just, I just wonder how this is going to get turned around. How do we turn the clock back in time? How do we get back to before Columbine? Is it possible? I think it starts with parents being mindful of what's going on with their children. And I don't necessarily mean being like a helicopter parent because you know, you can't suffocate your kids, but being mindful, you know, what are they doing on the internet? Are they spending all hours of the night on the computer? Okay. But why, what, what is so captivating on the computer that they're finding, you know, just have that honest conversation. What are you doing on the computer? What kind of websites are you on? You know, do some research, find out what's going on. If your kid has gone from bubbly and outspoken with this big personality to more sullen and withdrawn, you know, what is going on? There is no shame in therapy. Talk to, have them talk to a therapist, you know, get that education, find out what is going on because nothing is going to get close to beginning to start getting better. If parents don't know what's going on with their kids and if kids don't start developing that healthy fear and respect of authority right and i think it does start at home or, or it certainly did back you know in years past when i say start at home they're not being monitored you're right not to be helicopter parents but what about going on facebook and seeing who they're involved with what they're posting many of them post manifestos um, they're proud of it. They want to kill. What's wrong with looking at what your kid is actually saying? And if the kid is planning to murder or is obsessed with homicide or is obsessed with getting even with people, bring them to a counselor. Bring them to uh, somebody who can keep them in, in reality and get them out of the idea that. Being a murderer is cool. You know, this idea that, oh, if I, you know, like Rod Farrell wants to be immortal. If I do this, Fingold and Harris became immortal in what they did. So it's in the media. It's talked about. They're talked about. One of the things the media has done, which is positive, is that we don't hear about the killer as much as it used to be. They're not getting the attention that they think they're going to get by um, a schoolhouse shooting. The media has wised up to this and has no longer given them the status, if you will, of being 15 minutes of fame or more than 15 minutes of fame, of being, you know, analyzed and, and almost cajoled by the media back in time. I think that's one good thing. but. I mean, in the case of Heather Wendorf, I will tell you this. Even though she was not convicted of murder, she was not tried for the murder of her parents, her sister got up on the stand and said, Heather did make that statement that she wanted her parents killed. That was something that was mind-blowing. And beyond that, after this was all over, after I had my book out, which Heather, you know, worked with me quite a bit, after all of that, when, it, when the book was out, I called her. She was now in college in a different state. And she was talking about her new life and everything was fine. She seemed to not care at all that her parents were gone. Um, in fact, this is the thing. 
she told me, oh, it's all good. I have a new boyfriend. I have new cat, a new cat. I'm happy. It's good. I said, what's the name of the cat? She said, Lucy. Oh, that's great. You know, I'm glad that you're there. I don't know what else to say to her. You know, she's lost her parents, for God's sake, from the time she was a teen. And you know what she tells me? She says, yeah, Lucy. It stands for Lucifer. Now, think about that for a minute. If you could see my face right now. like, (laughs) Oh, my God. This is where, you know, you have to really think. At the end of the day, the grand jury believed that she had nothing to do with this, that she was innocent, that she was unaware that anything would happen to her parents. And yet she's cavalier after she discovers that her parents are murdered. She doesn't do anything about it after she sees Rod Farrell holding up her mother's pearls. She goes along with the program in the car. And after it's all said and done, she's naming her cat after Lucifer. She's still into the devil. She's still into Satan worship. What the heck was going on back then? That's something that I was grappling with that I I couldn't even tell anyone about because the book was done and we didn't have podcasts back then. You know, I had already done interviews about the book prior to this and I couldn't go back and and tell anyone this, but it, it, it occurred to me that, man, this girl is evil. She was not innocent in all of this. Not at all. Looking back, I remember, you know, doing the research, covering the story, and I kept going back and forth on whether or not Heather had any sort of culpability in this, you know, whether or not she was complicit in this in any way. And I really, I I hemmed and I hawed, and I, I really couldn't definitively say whether I believed she had absolutely nothing to do with it or was completely oblivious to what was going to happen and here hearing that wow that that changes that absolutely changes everything right it does and it brings me back to the fact that she got away with it she had no consequences and you know as this has evolved over the years who else had no consequences who else has done things and as we are today, creating senseless acts of violence, thinking they can get away with it. And, and many of them do today. You know, not for schoolhouse shootings, but when we look at what's going on right this minute, you think these students, these people who are protesting, feel they're going to pay the price for this? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. And, and that's why they get wilder and wilder. And you got to wonder, what is it in? It's not just a lone shooter. It's no longer just somebody who's a psychopath, somebody who, um, you know, has a need for fame, has a need to be no, notorious. No, 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 no. Now we have people that are joined together and, and literally just committing chaos, anarchy. It's, it's something that really has affected me. That really, you know, and I wrote another book called Cruel Sacrifice about four teenage girls who murdered a 12-year-old. At the time that I wrote that, again, in the 90s, prior to writing The Embrace, it was unheard of that teenage girls would kill a 12-year-old. It was unheard of. There was nothing like that. And they were an anomaly. They were considered, you know, something, people that were psychotic that were a part of peer pressure, that, I mean, and those, those girls were given, uh, the main two girls were given 50 years and 60 years. I thought that in writing these books about teen violence, I thought that it would be a cautionary tale for parents, for anyone who's reading my work. I have a huge following. My, you know, my readers are very into what I write. It's not just young people. And there are young people in college who read this, these books and said, you know, basically, wow, like, how does this happen? Or we can't believe it. And now they have to worry about being in school and thinking that a shooter could come in at any time. And what about all the students? There was one student I talked to 
um, about campus shootings who in the interview just said, yeah, we've had them. We had one of them on campus. We, you know, but we just watch ourselves and we're much more cautious. Like they're accepting it. It's crazy to me. It, it's genuinely crazy to me. Like how much has changed and how much teenagers and young adults and kids have changed from what they used to be. It's really obviously a serious issue has become serious when so many colleges have this going on, when students are joining other agitators and just creating a world where nobody feels safe anymore. You know, as juveniles, and they feel they'll be tried as juveniles, even if they have committed murder, they feel it won't be, it'll be a short sentence. I, I just don't know where to go from here. However, I will say that I think people who read my book, The Embrace, or my other book, Cruel Sacrifice, will start to look at what their teens are doing, much more so. We'll, we'll start to monitor, but also keep teens in the house. You know, had Heather been monitored more so, she would have been able to get out of the house as a teenager and just take off. I know that that's something I couldn't do back in time. Could you? Oh, absolutely not. Absolutely not. And I I grew up with someone that could. And I remember she she had just run away. It was, you know, she she was never getting into like real trouble or anything, but she would run away when she would get into it with her mom. And I will never forget my mother, after having listened to my friend's mom cry and be worried sick over her daughter, went up to my friend after she came home and was like, you know what? I have to thank you because Courtney will never do what you've done. She will never act the way that you do. And she was right. I never would. I I never went gallivanting off all over town. You know, my my mother knew where I was. If I was going to be out late, I called her, said, hey, I'm staying out late. You know, this is who I'm with. And kids don't do that now. They go where they want, when they want. And half the time, the parents drop them off wherever. And it's okay, I'll see you whenever you decide to come home. It's like, no, your 16-year-old should be home by like 9 o'clock and safe. Not out till 2, 3, 4 o'clock in the morning. And again, this is why I say it does start at home. There is there is a, a responsibility that should be incumbent on parents to watch, to enforce rules, to even if there's not a law that is going after these these young people, there should be parents that, like your mother, have warned you have shown you what it is that can happen if you go down the wrong path and yet what's happening today has a lot to do with peer pressure it's like oh okay other people are doing it i'll join in it's cool i'm i'm a cool person now and i think in the embrace that is exactly what happened kids went along you know with somebody who felt who promised them the you know immortality and even though they really didn't believe it, even though, you know, they questioned it seriously because this could not happen, they went along with it anyway because they loved being in the fantasy, because they loved the idea that they could get away with this. So I hope that people read it. I hope that people read Crow Sacrifice as well and see this cautionary, these cautionary tales as something that forces them to monitor their kids, even if they feel they shouldn't or can't. 100%. And I I will have the links. They are available on Amazon to Cruel Sacrifice and The Embrace. The Embrace I just finished. It is not only a phenomenal read, but it is a cautionary tale. And I really encourage parents and teenagers to read it. You know, learn what can happen. You know, obviously that is an extreme worst case scenario, but it's a very real scenario yeah and it's becoming more and more real these days with this violence of people going in and shooting up everybody in parkland you know and the parents now not being able to do anything about it after the fact the punishment does not fit the crime which also needs to change exactly 
And so these are the things when I wrote these books back almost 30 years ago, I truly thought parents would realize and look at these cautionary tales. But instead, parents who have a child that's off, they don't look at it. They don't want to see it. And it's too late when they've committed these acts of violence. So I think that's really what I wanted to say with you today, Courtney. That's really the message. And I hope people listen to that message and parents, you know, listen to the fact that you can't be afraid to monitor your children and be aware of what they're doing. You can't be afraid to be the parents. You know, it's not if there's something going on with your child, it's not necessarily a reflection of you. And you can't be afraid to think that it's a reflection of you and your parenting style. It just means that there's something going on. And it very well could be an outside force that has nothing to do with you. So you need to be aware of what is going on with your children. Exactly. And I hope, as I say, that this message, which I thought would get to people back in time and these things would stop and people could see what half with teenagers have done. Um, I thought that that would be something that would, would change the minds of parents, would get parents to be more involved with their kids, understand that they have to be, that they can't just let their kids run wild. And instead, we have this chaos now, and I think parents need to turn it around. I think that's the only way this is going to turn around. That's it. I agree. I I absolutely agree. There needs to be a change. As I said, I will have the links to both books down below. You can get them on Amazon. And thank you, Aphrodite, for joining me today, having this really powerful conversation that I do think a lot of people need to hear. It's a tough conversation. And people need to be open to it. Parents need to to really listen to it because there are terrible things going on in the world and it, it does start at home. So Aphrodite, I thank you for bringing attention to this. Well, thank you, Courtney, for having me on. And I really appreciate the opportunity to try to influence parents, adults, to get them not to be afraid of their kids and what they're doing, as you say. That's the way this has to happen. That's the issue. And I appreciate you having me on today, Courtney. I really do. It's an honor as always. As always, guys, thank you so much for listening. And I will see you in the next chapter of the Book of the Dead. Bye, guys. Much for listening to this chapter of the Book of the Dead. And don't forget that you can always connect with us on Instagram. You can connect with us on Twitter and you can absolutely connect with us on Patreon. We also have a merch store as well that we have frequent discount codes coming out for so that you guys can get merch hand-drawn by myself at a better cost. We hope you have a lovely rest of your week and just remember, please be kind. And don't forget to always stay safe, stay curious, and stay vigilant. Bye guys. Bye.